Okay, so here they're saying that beryllium and aluminium exhibit exhibit many properties which are similar through that, but they differ in okay forming covalent halides, forming polymeric hydrides, exhibiting maximum covalency in compounds, exhibiting amphoteric nature in their oxides. So let's explore this one by one. So forming covalent halides, like let's say we are talking about BeCl2. I'll just write it here. BeCl2 is a halide of beryllium and AlCl3 is the corresponding halide of aluminium, right? So these two are definitely uh, covalent in nature, right? So this is definitely correct. They do exhibit similar properties when it comes to forming covalent halides. This is correct. Forming polymeric hydrides. So you have BeH2 which exists as a polymer and similarly you have ALH3 which also exists as a polymer, right? These two do not exist as monomers, they exist as polymers generally. So this is what, uh, again, it's a similar property between beryllium and aluminium. Then exhibiting maximum covalency in compounds. When you look at beryllium, its covalency is going to be 4 and when you look at aluminium, the covalency is 6, right? So this is where they differ. They do not exhibit same maximum covalency in their compounds. Option D, exhibiting amphoteric nature in their oxides. This is interesting. So you have beryllium oxide and you have Al2O3. You know that both of these are amphoteric in nature, which means that they can react with both acids and bases, right? So again, this is a similar property between uh, beryllium and aluminium. In fact, beryllium and aluminium have a lot of similar properties and this is attributed to the diagonal relationship which I hope you remember from the chapter, uh, chapter periodic properties, right? So here you can see there's one thing which is not common between beryllium and aluminium which is their maximum covalency which means option C exhibiting maximum covalency in compounds is going to be the right answer to this question. So here you have for a gas phase decomposition, PCl5 decomposes to give you PCl3 plus Cl2. What happens to delta H and delta S in this reaction, right? So see, basically you are heating up the initial system, which is your PCl5 was your initial system. You heated it up, right? So because of which what happens, there is a change in delta H definitely. But what happens? Delta H increases, right? So uh, H changes, delta H increases, right? This is for sure. Now you have delta S, which is nothing but the change in entropy, right? So what happens to entropy? When you started, you had PCl5. You had one mole of, let's say, PCl5 gas. And at the end of the reaction, you had uh, one mole of PCl3 and one mole of Cl2. So what happened? You increased the entropy in the system. How? by increasing the number of gaseous moles, right? So your delta S is also going to be greater than zero. So your delta H is greater than zero, change in enthalpy is greater than zero, and change in entropy is also greater than zero, which means uh, option B, delta H greater than zero and delta S greater than zero is going to be the right answer to this question. All right, so here we have a question from the idea of interconversion of concentration terms, which we studied in the chapter mole concept. Right? So they're saying calculate the molality of a 1 liter solution of 68% H2SO4 weight by volume. Right, If the density of the solution is given to you is 1.80 gram per ml. So basically they have density is 1.8 gram per ml. You have to calculate molality is going to be what? What is molality? Molality is nothing but number of moles of solute number of moles of solute per kg of per kg of solvent right so this is what molality is uh, they have given you the concentration of the solution so they're telling you that it is 68 percent weight by volume h2so4 what does it mean it means that if I were to talk about one liter of the solution I will have 680 grams of h2so4 in one liter of solution okay this is what they've told you and you need to calculate the molality of one liter right so volume is given to you as one liter so now let's get started first things first we'll find out the mass of the solution 
how do we do that you know that density is equal to mass upon volume which means mass is going to be density into volume right so mass of solution is going to be density which is 1.8 multiplied by volume which is 1 liter or 1000 ml 1.8 gram per ml right that's why i'm taking the volume also in ml so basically you get 1800 grams to be the mass of the solution that you are dealing with from the percentage concentration percentage weight by volume concentration we know that the mass of solvent uh, sorry mass of solute right mass of solute is going to be 680 grams so mass of solvent will be what 1800 minus 680 how much does this come out to be you have 1200 minus 80 which is uh, 1120 so you have 1120 grams this is the mass of solvent okay so you have everything you need to calculate the number of moles of solute what is this going to be 680 mass of solute grams divided by molar mass of the solute what is going to be the molar mass of the solute it's h2so4 so i hope you have the value on your tips by now it is going to be 98 gram per mole right so basically i'm going to approximate this because i want to you know get done with the calculations quickly i'm going to write 98 is approximately 100 so i will get number of moles as approximately 6.8 okay so we have everything now let's find out the molality molality is going to be this 6.8 moles that is the number of moles of solute divided by mass of solvent right that is mass of solvent in kilograms you have 1120 grams so 1120 grams how do i convert this to kilograms divided by 1000 okay so this will cancel out and you will get a kilogram here okay now what do we have we have 6.8 moles into 10 to the power of 3 divided by 1120 right this be basically mole per kg so you have 10 to the power or let's write it as 100 10 to the power 2 divided by 112 i cancelled out 110 you get these many moles per kg of solvent okay so kg of solvent is what i will write here cool now you need to simplify this if you want to calculate then go ahead and calculate by all means what you can do is you can approximate okay you can see that you have 112 uh, and you have 100 in the numerator okay so basically this value is going to be slightly lesser than one so your approximate molality is going to be uh slightly lesser than 6.8 another thing you need to remember that here we just uh, approximated so you need to factor that in as well your molar uh, molality that you are expecting has to be less than 6.8 and you can see close enough value that is less than 6.8 is going to be 6.2 molar right so option b 6.2 molar is going to be the right answer to this question all right so here we have a question from the chapter states of matter we are talking about the gaseous state and in particular we are talking about the root mean square speed of uh, given gases right so they're saying that the ratio of the root mean square speed or the rms speed of h2 gas at 50 kelvin and that of o2 gas at 800 kelvin is going to be what fine you have to find out the ratio of the rms speed of h2 gas and o2 gas at different temperatures so let's get started you know the formula for rms speed or v rms is going to be under root of 3 rt by m this is the formula for rms speed so uh, what we will do is you can see that uh, 3 r is a constant so i'm going to remove that i'm going to write v rms 1 by v rms 2 is going to be under root of uh t1 m2 by t2 m1 this is what i'm going to write down fine so let's see if your let's say your gas one 
is H2 at 50 Kelvin and let's say your gas 2 is O2 at 800 Kelvin, right? So now what do we get? We get VRMS 1 by VRMS 2 is going to be under root of, what's the first gas? You have hydrogen as the first gas, temperature T1 is 50 Kelvin. Okay, this is divided by 800 Kelvin, multiplied by, I can ignore the K, right? Because everything is in the same units. So now, what is the M2, mass of the second gas, molar mass of second gas, right? It's oxygen O2, molar mass is going to be 16 into 2, 32 gram per mole cube, right? 32 here, and then you have hydrogen, whose molar mass is 2 gram per mole. Fine, so now let's get cancelling. You can see this will go once, this will go uh, 16 times. This will cancel out, this will go once, this will go 16 times, so this and this will cancel out. So basically, your ratio is coming out to be 1, which means both of them have the same speed at given temperature. Okay, so H2 at 50 degrees, uh, 50 Kelvin is uh, basically the same speed as oxygen O2 gas at 800 Kelvin. They have the same speeds. Ratio is going to be option C, 1, and that's the right answer to this question. All right, so look at this question. Here they're saying that at 1400 Kelvin for the reaction CH4 plus 2 H2S is in equilibrium with CS2 plus 4 H2, all of them are gases. You need to find out, uh, so they've given you Kc. 2.5 and 10 to the power of minus 3 is the value of Kc given to you. So a 10 liter reaction vessel contains 2 moles of CH4, 3 moles of CS2, 3 moles of H2 and 4 moles of H2S. And we have to choose the correct statement and our statements are given to us as such. Basically, what we will do is we'll find out the QC first from the given data. We'll compare QC and KC and we'll see in which direction our reaction is actually proceeding. So you have QC is equal to concentration of CS2 into concentration of H2 raised to the power of 4 divided by concentration of um, CH4 into concentration of H2S squared. Correct. So what is the concentration of CS2? You can see it is 3 moles in 10 liter vessel. So 3 by 10. Concentration of H2 is 3 moles in 10 liter vessel whole to the power of 4 divided by concentration of CH4 is going to be 2 by 10 and concentration of H2S is going to be 4 by 10 whole squared. Right. So this is uh, what you're dealing with. Let's simplify the numbers. So you have basically 3 to the power of 5 divided by 2 into 4 squares. So 2 into 2 to the power 4, that's nothing but 2 to the power 5. Multiplied by 10 to the power of minus 2, basically. I've simplified the exponent. So what is 3 to the power of 5? It's going to be uh, 243. So you have 243 here and 2 to the power of 5 is 32. Correct. And this is into 10 to the power of minus 2. Now what we will do is we will try and um, approximate and cancel out a few things. So um, what can we do? I am going to approximate this to 33. I am going to cancel it out. You will get 11. You will get um, 81. Right? So you got this. Now what I want you to do is write it as 81 into 10 to the power of minus 3 because I approximated 11 to 10. Okay? So I got 81 into 10 to the power of minus 3. I want you to write like this because you can compare it to Kc directly then. Your Kc is 2.5 into 10 to the power of minus 3. You got Qc is equal to 81 into 10 to the power of minus 3, which means Qc is greater than Kc and the reaction will proceed in the backward direction. Right? Good. So basically, reaction will proceed in the backward direction is option C. So option C is going to be the right answer to this question.